DB. Um, I work on the core server, the, the actual database. Uh, also, I work on the sharding router, um, which distributes your queries if you run in a sharded environment. Uh, additionally, I worked on the Mongo C driver, and I'm still uh, maintaining that, although uh, there's far fewer users of that than the other driver, so that takes much less of my time. Um, let's see. So, quick intro to MongoDB, what, what it's all about. Um, the idea is there's a lot of features in databases that people actually want and actually use. Range queries, query by value, uh, secondary indexes, these sorts of things. and um, in, in this push towards scalability, a lot of people are giving them up. And we don't actually think that's necessary. Um, we think that you can build a very high performance and scalable data, uh, database with a friendly data model. Um, but without, you know, w without going into this key value store or something uh, annoying like that. Um, so just to start, can everybody in the back read this line? Okay, that's about the smallest text that I expect anyone to read, so that's good. Um, let's see. Um, there we go. So, just a warning, since this is Berlin Buzzwords, we're not completely Buzzwords compliant. Um, we do use a binary protocol rather than HTTP REST. Um, and, you know, this could be seen as a downside or a benefit. Uh, to us, we consider it a benefit because that means that we actually have to write language drivers and uh, we have to, you know, I try to integrate into your languages. Um, additionally, it provides uh, some speed benefits. If anybody's done socket programming, you know that the read system call takes a size. And if you're working with text, it's a little hard to get that size. Um, so th there's a couple reasons. Uh, additionally, you know, it's easier for a machine to work with uh, binary data than text data. And most of the time when you're talking to a database, um, you're talking to it through a language or you're talking to it through an interface or, or something like that. So it, it, it almost seems silly to send textual, to, to convert from whatever the machine's working with to textual data, send it over the wire, then convert back into something that the machine can work with. So one of the nice things that Mongo can do is we actually just, wh whatever the format you send over the wire is actually the exact same format we use on disk and in memory um, as our internal data structure. So that gives us some speed boost. And we can, there's basically one copy when you write and one copy when you read. Uh, th that's one of the, the, the nice things that we're able to do. Um, additionally, we use JSON rather than, uh, sorry, BSON rather than JSON, um, and th that's what I was talking about with the, the binary protocol. Um, it's the format has some nice advantages in that it can be uh, used as an in-memory data structure. Um, we are written in C++, not Erlang. I know that there are a lot of Erlang fans. We do have uh, actually two drivers for Erlang at the moment um, that, that were written by the community, and uh, apparently a lot of people are using it. Um, uh, you 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 know, you don't get the novelty of writing your uh, queries using MapReduce for everything. Um, well, I'll admit, when I, when I was playing with CouchDB before I, you know, way back when, when before I started working at 10Gen, was playing with these uh, databases, uh, you know, it was fun to write these MapReduce queries to do uh, everything. Uh, but to some extent, it's, it's a little easier to just write something that resembles a more traditional ad hoc query. Um, and additionally, we don't actually do hashing. I know a lot of the databases do hashing. The only time we do hashing is for authentication. Um, but we, we don't actually hash your data. Uh, we find that B trees are nice because you can do range queries and all sorts of things like that that are useful. So just to give you an idea what Mongo looks like. By the way, I'm going to have a lot of code. Um, if there's anything you don't understand, feel free to holler out. Uh, but I just I want to give you guys a feel for what it's like to work with Mongo rather than just talk about it. So um, the way it works is, and, and this is the JavaScript interface. Um, pretty much every language, uh, at least the dynamic languages, look very similar. Um, obviously, Java doesn't have the nice map syntax, so you can't use that. But um, most, of the, uh, most of the languages look very similar. And so you, you start with a DB object, um, which represents a specific DB, um, and similar to a relational database. Um, you can have multiple databases in a single uh, installation. And the idea there is that basically if you're hosting multiple products on the same, uh, same server, you would put each one into a separate database uh, if, if you want to maintain that separation. Um, and beyond that, we have uh, collections which are analogous to um, uh, SQL tables. Um, the difference is that they're not tabular. They're just a collection of objects. 
Um, and one of the cool things you can do, and I don't show it here, but uh, dot is a valid operator, and most of the um, most of the languages allow you to just say like users dot queries dot insert. And I've used that in the past to when I wanted to store every query that was run along with some performance metrics and who was running it so I could keep track of users. Um, I, ha I just did exactly that. I took whatever the uh, collection name was, appended dot uh, queries, and inserted the query in there. So that's kind of a nifty uh, tool you can use. Um, so our data model is um, it's like JSON, but it's... Um, know you're not actually going to be writing JSON uh, you're going to be writing a map or a hash or a dict or whatever your language happens to call its native structure um, so here I'm using the uh, JavaScript uh, object format um, and the the primary key is always ID and I'll, I'll speak a bit more about that in a bit um, in this case I'm creating users and uh, my user ID is M Stern um, one, one of the ideas is it's kind of silly to just put a, a numeric key where you could use uh, a, a natural identifier, like a string. Um, because it's all going into a B tree anyway, it's not like you're going to hit a huge performance difference putting in a username there rather than an integer. Um, it, it all works out about the same. And you're going to save yourself uh, an additional index and uh, if you want to be able to look up by user ID. So really it's easier to just put the user ID in that. And the same for other fields, um, uh, other collections. Uh, if you have a natural ID, put one in. If you don't, we have a solution for that. Um, which I will discuss uh, when I get to IDs. Um, the, the, the next part looks very similar to just a standard relational, uh, you know, just a flat key value. Uh, the nice thing is that you can add and remove fields as you want. Uh, if you decide you want to start, you know, um, I now want to um, add favorite food, I could uh, just go ahead and throw that in there. Um, and the database doesn't care that you've added this new field on a collection which didn't have it before. Um, uh, now, now getting something that's a bit different, uh, with the name field, um, just feel free to break it up if you want um, to store things like that. Um, in this case, uh, I don't have my mid middle name. I could um, and just store things. Um, moving on, uh, arrays. This is probably the coolest feature um, uh, in, in the basic database. So you can just, re uh, traditionally, when you wanted to do tags or any sort of a list in a relational database, the solution was you have your uh, tagged object, you'd have your um, tags, and then you'd have this other join table, which doesn't actually represent anything in the real world. It's just this thing to link the two. And that's silly. Just put the, just put the tags as an array in there. And the cool thing is when you try to query against it, um, it basically will do a, uh, similar to an SQL inquiry, but in reverse. So it'll say, if I said, uh, find me everyone who likes beer, uh, it would find me in this case. Um, uh, obviously, you can also store numbers. Uh, we support uh, strings, numbers, uh, uh, double, int, in 64 um, We actually can separate those if you want to make sure that you're storing a full 64-bit with int. Um, all the JSON types, uh, Boolean, null, all that good stuff. Um, additionally, we support a few extras. One of the nice things with using BSON is we're not bound by the JSON spec. Uh, for example, we do have a first-class date object, uh, which stores millisecond resolution dates. Um, additionally, we have a regex type uh, for doing queries with regexes and a um, binary data type. So if you have some binary blob that you want to store with this object, um, such as uh, a hash, rather than storing it as a hex field um, or um, escaping it so that it's a, a valid string that's safe, um, for, uh, you know, the valid UTF-8 string. Uh, instead, you can just uh, store it as a binary blob and have it take up half the space. So uh, that's kind of nice for uh, a lot of use cases. Um, and like I said, we have arrays. We also have arrays of objects. And just like with JSON, you can keep going and nesting to incredible uh, depths. Um, an example from my prior job, we wanted to collect uh, statistics about people that were running reports. Now, each report had multiple columns. Each column could have various groups. Um, each group could have a list of settings and so on and so forth. And the cool part is you can uh, continue to query on them. Um, and they don't have to be, just like with everything else in Mongo, there's no uh, fixed schema. Um, the schema is dictated by your application. So uh, in this case, I'm storing a full city street, floor, zip code, all that. And then you can just write your application so that it will display these fields 
um, correctly. Um, one way to do it is just display a list of uh, values. Um, let's see. So this is what it looks like to actually write your queries. Um, so look up by ID, uh, write an object, ID, mstern. Um, same thing with company. And the only difference between find one and find is that find is will return a cursor that you can iterate over and returns batches and handles all that nice stuff for you so you don't have to worry about it. Um, whereas find one will just take the first result of a find. Excuse me. Um, additionally, I know, um, I seem to remember uh, Matthias mentioning earlier uh, that NoSQL don't, doesn't support range queries easily. Well, we do. Um, in fact, <laughs> uh, of, of all the limitations that he listed of NoSQL databases, the only one that we don't support um, is transactions. Um, hmm? That wasn't listed. <laughs> <laughs> I will. Um, so uh, we, we, we don't support transactions. But um, because you can have these complex objects, you generally don't need it. So you know the classic transaction case, which actually doesn't make any sense uh, because it's not the way the real world works, is you know credit one account, debit one account inside of a transaction, roll back, all that magic stuff. Um, obviously, banks don't actually do it that way. They do something far more complicated and resolve things at the end of the day. And you know, try writing a check for hundred thousand dollars. They'll take it. And uh, you know, it, the world is eventually consistent in that manner. Um, but uh, <coughs> excuse me. The um, because you can just record these complex objects, you could uh, just store an object that says creditor debitor and resolve that uh, transaction that way. Um, additionally, you don't need it for things like tags, which was another common use case for transactions. Um, now, as you'll notice, I didn't build any indexes on this. Um, in fact, I didn't have to do any sort of setup. I just threw my data in there and started querying it. And that works as long as you don't have oodles and oodles of data. If you have um, a, s a small amount of data, you don't even really need any indexes other than the one that you get on ID for free. Um, so you can just query for things, and it'll work great. Um, now, obviously, that won't wor continue to work as you get hundreds of thousands, millions, billions of uh, um, records. So you know, put an index on fields. And this is, it's very similar to a um, relational. Uh, however, you can index arrays. You can index subfields. Um, you can just put, uh, uh, for example, if I wanted to uh, index this field, uh, it would just be ensure index name.last1, and it would index name.last. If I were to, um, oh, unfortunately I didn't update this. This is supposed to say uh, likes, by the way, not knows. Um, <laughs> sorry about that. Um, so. A as you'll remember, uh, likes was an array. And so um, when you index an array, what happens is we insert one entry into the index for each item in the array, um, which is the way that you're intended to query against arrays. So for example, if I want to find everyone who likes beer, it's that simple. There's no find me the beer tag, join it on the join table, then find everything joined with that that has, um, th th that has an ID in there. Just find me everyone who likes beer. Um, additionally, you can do inqueries, um, which also work on arrays. Um, find me either spelling of beer. Um, uh, there's all queries for everyone who likes both beer and milk. Um, hopefully not at the same time. Um, <laughs> you can uh, throw regex queries. And uh, uh, a, a good use of this is actually uh, Bitly. Uh, recently went into production uh, for one of their features using Mongo. Um, their user history, you can actually search your user history on Bitly, um, if you want to treat it like a bookmark store, um, you can actually just use regexes to query all of your uh, Bitly links. And so what happens is they'll just um, put, uh, I'm not exactly sure what their schema is, but it's probably something similar to uh, you know, db.links.find uh, uh, user, username, uh, content, and a regex. Um, it makes it really easy to do features like that. Um, and additionally, if you're used to doing sorting, again, that's possible either with or without an index. Um, skip, limit for pagination, although usually there are better ways to do pagination. Um, but that does work. A little bit of shameless self-promotion. Um, this is a little tool I wrote on the side. Um, kind of makes the queries look prettier uh, if you're a Python user. Um, so you can just say, uh, uh, basically describe it 
as you would in Python, and that converts to a Mongo query object. Um, I actually, this is one of my favorite ones because you can use the nifty Python between syntax. Um, so, any questions so far in the back? Um, so you can have, we, we use a reader writer lock, so you can have n readers and, but only one writer at a time, and it's uh, ex exclusive, you can have either one or the other. Um, but in general, we found that that's completely fine. Um, in gen um, we've seen upwards of 100,000 inserts per second. Um, and so, in we, when we've looked at doing uh, finer grain locking or things like that, it actually slows it down to the point where you end up having a net negative, um, which is why we haven't done that yet. Um, yes? Uh, no, we define, oh yes, uh, the, f the first question was on uh, concurrency, um, readers blocking writers and so forth. The second question that was just asked, was uh, about byte ordering issues. We just define little endian as the byte order because that's what everyone uses, um, basically. <laughs> um, it, so uh, we've, we've just defined that for the server. And the client libraries are all set up so that if you're on a big endian system, uh, it will convert to uh, little endian to send over the wire. But the server uh, just it, it has to run on a big Indian, uh, sorry, little Indian platform, and that, that's how we managed to do that. A uh, little bit by just avoiding the problem. <laughs> um, hmm? Vax, too? Wow. Okay. <laughs> we do not support Vax. Uh, we have one guy once a month, repeatedly, every month, he will come by and ask if we support Spark yet. Uh, <laughs> yeah, uh, we, we told him he's welcome to attempt to port it, but uh, <laughs> it is not on our, uh, our, our roadmap. Uh, um, so uh, this, you, you can also, uh, if you're used to doing, uh, rather than, those were all select star equivalents. If you want to just get a few fields, oh, sorry, another question? Yes, yes. Um, I do have some slides towards the end um, about scalability. Um, uh, we can talk more if you have specific questions. Um, so if, if you want to just select specific fields, um, all you have to do is just specify which fields you want. Um, and if uh, one of the things that we recently added in the 1.5 series, which will become our next stable release, 1.6, is the ability to select parts of an array. So if you wanted to um, grab the first 10 comments or the last 10 comments or uh, skip 10 comments and return the next limit of 10 comments, you can also do that. Um, that was a very requested feature. Um, more cool stuff, geospatial. Um, uh, Foursquare recently switched, uh, is Foursquare big in Berlin? I don't know if uh, that's, popular over here, but basically it's a uh, site where you can walk around on your iPhone. Um, hmm? Okay. Uh, so, <laughs> uh, you know, it, it's very geo, they, they recently ported their uh, venue lookups to using Mongo, uh, specifically because of our geospatial. They were, they were using Postgres, but they were having issues with PostGIS, so they built their own, and they found out that the one that we built in worked better. So uh, they recently switched their venue search to using uh, our uh, geospatial, s and part of the nice thing about it is that it's designed to be just really simple and solve a very simple problem, which is, you know, store a location, look up things near this location. That's what it's good at. Um, it'll also do within queries, um, by the way, this is the location of the uh, 10 gen offices, uh, if you're curious what this is. Um, you can do, uh, what this will do is it will turn them in order of closeness. Um, additionally, you could find everything within a square or everything within a circle. Um, radius, if you. Updating. Um, one of the things that I've noticed is somewhat tricky in some of the other um, relational, uh, non-relational database products 
is doing partial updates. So um, as an example, you could, um, you know, I've got this massive typo in my massive blog post. Um, so I want to go ahead and quickly correct that. And just so I just, I just want to change the body, so I just changed the body. Um, additionally, we have something, uh, if you called, um, rather than insert, if you called uh, save, it would do um, what's known as an upsert, which will do just take whatever object you give it and uh, uh, insert if it exists and update it, just replace the whole object if it doesn't. Um, the, the next one is uh, add to set. So with, uh, if you've got these large arrays, you don't want to have to fetch the object, uh, then add the array, then ship the whole object back. Sometimes these objects can be quite large, uh, multiple megabytes. Um, we do have a limit of four megabytes per object right now. We're thinking about expanding that to 32. Uh, still talking about it, um, but uh, currently it's a four megabyte limit. But if you have objects that large, you don't want to have to fetch and store them every time. So um, you can just add this tag. Um, it's kind of nice. Uh, another advantage is that if you have multiple concurrent workers and they're both adding tags, you don't have to worry about uh, them conflicting when between a fetch and a set. Um, it'll just, it, it'll, the, all of the uh, dollar operators guarantee atomicity. So it's guaranteeing that um, when you're adding this to the set, you're not going to end up corrupting uh, because somebody else had added it and you're going to erase that. Um, you can also do an ink. And this one, so basically if you're adding uh, a tag, uh, it's quite common to want to maintain a count of tags so that you can build up these uh, tag clouds. So the easiest way to do that is to have a separate tags collection insert the tag as the ID, increment the count, and y if you uh, use an upsert, uh, it will insert the tag, as I mentioned, or just increment it. And uh, if the field doesn't exist, we do the smart thing and just uh, set it to one. Uh, same thing if you add to a set that doesn't exist, we just create an array that is the, uh, the object. Um, this was recently added for 1.4. Um, you can now, if you have an array of objects, uh, of comment objects, and you want s uh, to allow voting on these objects. Uh, previously, you had to do the uh, fetch, uh, modify, and store, and you know we try to avoid doing that. And uh, so we s added this little thing called the dollar positional operator. So, oh, I see I overflowed here. Um, <laughs> uh, basically, you include a query into the uh, array in your qu the query portion of an update. And then it will, uh, uh, whatever part of the array matches will be updated by your updater. Um, so you can increment votes or change uh, various stats. Uh, removing, it's you know so simple it doesn't even warrant a slide really. Um, just db.stuff.remove some query and it'll remove all that stuff. Um, currently, um, by default, we do this as a background operation. Um, if for some reason you don't want to do that, uh, you can specify atomic equals true, and it will block the database until it finishes removing. Um, sometimes you want to have that guarantee, but usually you don't want to wait for a remove. Yes? Yes. Um, oh, so the, the, the question was, um, if a remove by a non-ID um, will like table. If it's doing a table scan, yes. If you have an index on the field, no. It's uh, similar to just it basically the same as doing the query. Uh, if the query would take a long time, the remove is going to take a long time. If the query would be quick, it would be quick. So, um, so quick side note: primary keys are always called underscore ID in Mongo. Um, they're automatically indexed. Um, they can be of any type except for array because you don't want to have multiple primary keys, which is the semantics of a Mongo array. Um, that just gets weird. <laughs> um, but y if you really wanted to, you could have a binary primary key. You could have, um, you could have a, I in fact, you could even have an object as your primary key. Um, uh, you, you, uh, if you don't supply an ID, uh, like I mentioned, we will create one for you. And what happens is before uh, your object is sent over the wire to Mongo, what the, the client will add it for you. That way it can return the ID without having to do the SQL-esque, all right, I'm inserting, now let me get the last ID and then return it. You d it doesn't require a round trip. Um, it'll just 
uh, insert the ID into your object, uh, save it, and then return it directly. And uh, the format for our default IDs is uh, the, the, the question was, how does it work with concurrent inserts? Well, we designed the object ID format to be generatable by the clients in a distributed environment. That was one of the main goals with object ID generation. And the format is, uh, we start off, uh, the, the most uh, significant bytes are uh, a four-byte timestamp, followed by a three-byte machine ID, which is uh, intended to uniquely identify the machine, followed by a two-byte PID, so that if you're running multiple clients on the same, uh, mo uh, 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 multiple clients on the same machine, uh, they won't conflict, and then followed by an incrementing counter. And th there are some really nice properties to this, one of them being that it will tend to increase over time. So you, if you were to sort by ID, that's basically equivalent to sorting by insertion time. Um, additionally, if you're generating on a single machine uh, from a single thread, um, you're guaranteed that they will be increasing. Um, uh, th they would be increasing from that machine. Um, so, th and uh, one of the nice things with having them being increasing is that because we use B trees, um, we can you can have that small portion of data being hot because uh, a lot of sites people only care about the last minute, the last day, the last second, but you want to store data forever. Um, so, you know, the classic problem with a B tree is that you may have to jump around a lot. Well, b if you can keep only one, you know, if the, if the tree's like this and you only look at this area, it's very easy to fit that area in RAM and not worry about the rest. Um, so th that adds some very nice performance characteristics. So I've got about 15 minutes left. I intentionally created more slides than I have time for. So you guys have uh, basically f four choices. One, I can spend a lot of time on replication, including a live demo. Um, I could spend a lot of time on sharding and go into that. Um, I could try to rush through both, or I could stop now and take questions. So, <laughs> okay, rush it is. All right, I'll go quick. Replication, just do it. Uh, <laughs> you should make sure that you're running replication. This is something Jan wanted to make sure that I said, and it is in the slides. We do not provide durability guarantees on a single server. This is how we can maintain a um, uh, 100,000 or more uh, inserts per second. Um, we don't do an F-sync every time you do an insert. Um, excuse me. So what we do is we have a, a replication system set up so that it's cheap, it's easy to replicate your data. You can um, just throw more nodes at it. And uh, some of the other NoSQL databases are purely in memory. Um, so, you know, we're certainly more durable than that in that if you were to shut a node down and bring it back up, your data is still going to be there. However, if you pull the plug on your, no on your server, which is unlikely, um, assuming you're co-hosted and uh, all that, or if you, uh, w what's far more likely is that you're running on your MacBook and the battery dies. That's uh, the number one complaint that we've gotten. Um, so, don't run your database on your MacBook in production, please. <laughs> uh, and uh, probably goes without saying, but you should have a UPS on your servers and you know actual, you know, real setup. Um, and 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 in reality, when you think about it, you 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 don't want to wait to bring your database back up. When, when your database goes down, you want it to flip over and become another database. And and so so that's what we we provide automatic failover for that. So, you know, the, the guys at uh, the, the React presentation mentioned that uh, they don't have any special nodes. Um, in a replication system, we do have a master node, but it's set up so that it uh, can automatically fail over to a slave if you're running replica pairs. Um, there were some design issues with that, and we are, uh, the main one being that it's limited to a pair, only two. Um, we are replacing them with replica sets in 1.6, um, which is slated for July. Um, so that you can have as many uh, replicas as you want, and they will automatically fail between them um, based on constraints that you can provide. So really, that's the path that you want to get to durability, is just have more servers. Um, they're, they're usually cheaper than the extreme lengths that people go to to have high-performance, uh, durable uh, data source. And if you're already replicating, there's no point in paying the performance penalty on 
uh, durable storage. So the, uh, that's my warning. If you're running without replication production, just don't. Um, <laughs> uh, we, as I said, we, oh, we are master-slave, not uh, potentially consistent. Um, the, the, there are a lot of issues with eventually consistency, and it can be a little tricky to program to, and uh, one of the things that you can't do is counters. It's very difficult to have a counter in an eventually consistent system. Um, we can say that if you only query a master, you are guaranteed to have the most up-to-date version of that data. Whereas uh, if you're okay with querying slaves, you may get stale data, um, but you do have access to a master, and the count is guaranteed to always be increasing, so on and so forth. Um, so the, the way our replication works is that slaves do an initial sync of all the data in the database, and then they tr basically follow an operations log that the master keeps, um, and then just apply all of the operations that the master does. Um, and if you're running on something like uh, EBS on EC2, uh, you can do this nifty trick we added where you can just take a snapshot of either your master or your slave um, and then just bring up another slave using that and just tell it, you can go ahead and skip the initial sync and just start trailing the operations log. Um, can, you, can you do a live snapshot? Uh, to do a snapshot, uh, previously you had to shut it down uh, so that the data would be consistent. Uh, we added a feature called fsync lock, um, where you can send a command to tell it, do an fsync, flush everything to disk, um, which if it's EBS, it'll flush it to the EBS store, um, and then lock the database for writing. You can continue to do reads, um, so it, usually you'll want to do this on a slave, which isn't <laughs> taking writes anyway. Um, then take a snapshot, which is you know, usually fairly instantaneous, um, and then do a um, unlock. So you can do a hot backup. Additionally, we have um, other backup tools that are intended to be fully live while you're running, um, but they don't guarantee point-in-time snapshots. Um, that's the best way to get a point-in-time snapshot. Um, that also works very well with LVM if you're running on your own Linux setups. Um, you can just take an LVM snapshot, which uh, will be instant, and then unlock and then uh, copy your data out of the uh, snapshot. Um, I'm going to skip the live demo and come back to it if I have time. But um, if you wanted to follow along at home, uh, these are the steps to do a quick demo of replication. So preface on sharding and a little bit of a rant. Um, you probably don't need sharding. Um, it's, it's kind of this feature that we've noticed everybody wants, but almost nobody needs. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> it's, it's, it's kind of odd because it, it's just, it, it doesn't seem like the people who need it, uh, it, most of the people who need it have already built something. Um, and the people that are clamoring for it the loudest have absolutely no need for it and probably never will. Um, so just to give you an example from one of our users that has allowed us to release some of their data, um, wordnick.com, they're, uh, an attempt to collect a living dictionary of the English language. Um, they claim to have 1.7 million words and count, or sorry, 1.7 billion words and counting. Um, <laughs> and they, they say that it grows at a rate of 200 words per day, uh, <laughs> 200 new words per day, which is kind of interesting. Um, and they do things like keeping track of historical usage of words, um, and they'll, they'll plot, um, what's the term, uh, frequency charts of uh, how the usage of words has changed over time. It's a really cool site. Um, so. Uh, in production, um, uh, sorry, th this is while they were uh, while, while they were doing their l initial uh, dump from their um, old database to uh, MongoDB, they noticed a sustained rate of uh, 100,000 inserts per second. Um, and this was for 1.5 terabytes of data and 5 billion objects. Um, they, I think they said that it took about 12 hours to do the full dump of all of their data. Um, and then they did some uh, neat tricks. I'd highly suggest you look up, uh, if you look uh, Google for WordNick Mongo SF, um, they did a really nice presentation in uh, the, our Mongo conference in San Francisco um, where they describe how they transitioned. And it's a, it's a nifty method where they could say at runtime connect to either database to do your queries. Um, so they were able to just have a seamless transition. And they noticed that uh, while they were doing a load test to make sure that Mongo would be able to keep up, it was they were able to do 250,000 uh, lookups by ID per second. Um, 
And at that point, Mongo wasn't fully loaded, but their Java boxes were. And they decided we could optimize it to max, to like max out Mongo, but it's just not worth any more of our time to optimize it at that point. So th this is why I'm saying you probably don't need shard. Now, if you have you know, tens of terabytes, uh, you may start to need it. Or if you have all of your data that needs to be in RAM all the time, that's a good use for sharding. Um, you know, put a, excuse me, throw 10 servers with um, 16 gigs of RAM each, you've got 160 gigs of RAM right there to keep your data hot. Um, however, I will caution that we, we, we looked into the math on this, and uh, if you're considering EC2, it always makes sense to scale up rather than out. Um, Pricing-wise, at, at least for the US zones, um, and I'm pretty sure that the uh, EU zones are priced similarly, um, the if you want to get the next highest level of RAM, it's cheaper than getting, uh, basically to get double the RAM, it's cheaper to get a single node with double the RAM than to have two nodes with uh, the smaller amount of RAM. So um, another reason why you probably don't need sharding even if you're in the cloud, which is the main reason a lot of people are interested in sharding. Um, it just doesn't make financial sense to shard small nodes. It's just silly. Um, <laughs> um, and, and a final note, uh, their production you know, end-to-end -end queries um, returned from their API, they noticed they were four times as fast after the transition um, when, when querying their, AP their uh, external facing API um, than it was when they run MySQL. So um, if, if, you, you know, if anybody were to post this to Reddit, um, the first thing anybody's going to say is speed and scalability are different things and get all angry um, because but that's what people on Reddit do. Um, <laughs> but really, they're not that different. Scalability is a means, it's a way to get speed. If you were able to guarantee that a, a node would always give you microsecond response times, you're going to want a replica, obviously, but you know, th there's no reason to just throw more boxes at the problem if it's fast enough. That's just a waste of your time. Um, really, the, the point of scalability is to get speed. Um, so, end rant. <laughs> um, the way we do sharding. Um, there is no single point of failure. Um, we do have different node types. Um, we have a, uh, a MongoD, which is what stores the data. We have config servers, which remember where the data is, and those are just special purpose MongoD. They're identical to the MongoD server, just with different data. Um, and we also have MongoS routers. And the nice part about this is that because you can have multiple MongoS routers, uh, the recommended um, deployment strategy is put one MongoS server on each, um, on each app server, and then you can you're guaranteed to be going over localhost for that first hop. So you don't have to make two network hops and have twice the network saturation. Um, so that, that's one of the advantages to having these uh, different types of nodes. Um, you, and so when you want to transition from a single server to a sharded setup, tell your app to connect to the Mongo S rather than the Mongo D. Um, pick which collections are sharded, and then pick a shard key for those collections. So. Um, for example, um, you know, you, you don't always want to do, um, you, you're not always going to want to do ID. For example, if you have blog posts, um, a good example, a good way to shard would be on username. Um, uh, or uh, same thing with uh, Bitly. If they're storing uh, all of your links, um, then you can, uh, they, they shard by user. So that's, that's one reason not to shard by primary key. Um, and that's all. That's all the changes you have to make in your app. Uh, all of the other features, and by the way, I s mentioned like a small fraction of the features Mongo supported because I don't have three hours. Um, so don't assume that because I didn't mention it, Mongo doesn't support it. If there's some feature that you're curious about, please ask me. I'm going to be here for like a week and a half, so I have plenty of time. Um, and the cool part is we handle the rest. And just a, a quick demo, a uh, quick view. Your client connects to MongoS. This is the only thing it does. Oh, there we go. Uh, your client connects to a MongoS. The, the, ah. Everything above it, the complex stuff that you know, your app doesn't have to worry about, it connects to MongoS and it handles the rest. Um, each of these shards are re uh, replica sets. Uh, each replica in the set contains um, identical data, and they will automatically fail over between each other. Mongo S will handle the uh, the logic of making sure that everything works during a failover. Um, they'll also automatically migrate data between them. Um, so, 
uh, MongoS will handle the migrations automatically in the background. It'll handle balancing. It will handle <laughs> all of these complex things. It will even allow you to write data, write to a piece of data while it's being migrated. Um, that is one of the trickiest parts of this, um, and that's why you don't want to implement your own sharding system. <laughs> Um, because you do want to be able to move data while it's live and query it and all these things. Um, and these are the config servers which hold the metadata of this data is here, this data is on this shard, this data is on this shard. And uh, that's it. I actually still have time for questions. So questions or live demo of, shar of re uh, replication? Questions. questions. Did I hear questions? Question. Uh, B trees are self balancing. Uh, you mean the sharding balancing? Oh, uh, it, it's done at the time of the update. Oh, the, the question is when do we update our B trees? And uh, that's done at write time so that once the, the write has finished, um, it, it's, it's fully done and all the indexes are updated. Um, question back there? Uh, so the question is, uh, all the clients connect to one Mongo S, uh, uh, one Mongo S. Um, the only reason it looks like that is because we wanted to keep this uh, simple. Uh, <laughs> this, is this diagram, um, the uh, it, as you note, the, the the dots mean that you could have another client here which is connecting to this Mongo S, which then makes its own connections to each of the shards. And the idea is, uh, as I mentioned, that you would put the Mongo S on each uh, app server. So um, you know, your, your the, the, that connection would be over localhost, so that's not a bottleneck, and your bottleneck is going to be the network, but that would be a bottleneck anyway. Yes? I'm sorry. Yes. Uh, hang on. Uh, the question is, do we have index support for our geo queries? Yes. Uh, rather than saying one or negative one to specify the ordering, um, you specify the string 2D, and that creates the geo index. And in fact, uh, geospatial is currently the only feature that requires an index. Um, we, we don't do unindexed geospatial queries. Um, everything else works without an index, though. So. Um, but the attempt. Yes? Um, the question is, since we have the um, object ID, is it possible to extend that to be a, um, a versioning? And I'd say it could be, but I, I, I think that that's something that belongs at the layer above the database. That belongs, uh, conflict resolution is usually best handled by your application. Um, there's a lot of just nitpicky details that you're going to have to deal with that every application is going to need to handle differently. Um, when you allow writes to multiple locations um, of the same data. One of the, one of the things with sharding that I guess I didn't mention, um, for each object has a single master. There are multiple masters in the cluster, but each object has a canonical location where it lives. Um, and, and that's something that we want to guarantee because things like counters are very difficult to do any other way. Uh, yes, uh, I've got one more question. There, okay. So I noticed that with your project, you actually have the same syntax for using operators too. Thanks. The question is, uh, th you said that we had a, a, a sane syntax for um, the doing queries with the dollar operators. Um, I'm pretty sure that was Dwight Merriman. Um, I don't. I wasn't around at the time that he came up with it. Um, but he's a he's a smart guy, uh, and I'm not just saying that because he's my boss. Um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, so uh, just uh, I guess if you're interested in a little history, um, Dwight Merriman and Elliot Horowitz. Um, I'm not actually sure which of the two is my boss, but since we're ten people, it doesn't really matter. Um, <laughs> uh, the, the, they founded the company. Uh, they both, uh, Dwight founded DoubleClick and Elliot was a former employee. And they, they say this is the database that they wished they had when they were working on DoubleClick. So it's kind of from the operations experience of running a 
huge, uh, a huge center and with lots of requests uh, and needing to write their own scalable database that they kind of hacked together piecemeal before, now they, you know, they're, they're able to actually write a good one to solve other people's problems. So that's a little history lesson. So uh, if you have any more questions, please feel free to stop me. I'll be here tomorrow and I'll also be at Linux Talk if anybody else is uh, going to that. So thank you. <laughs>